In Judges chapter 9, we come across one of the sons of Gideon. If you remember Gideon, the Old Testament judge, that at the beginning of finding out about his life, that Gideon didn't think he could do much of anything. And then later on as his life grows and he gets into the form of being a judge, we find out that Gideon actually, because of the success that God gave him, Gideon fails. And we learned last week, if you're with us, you learned that success in itself is not bad. But success can stumble a saint. When we get so high up on the mountaintop, when we think that we don't need God, sometimes that we forget to look to God. We think that maybe we are God, that we're the one who put the food on our plates, that we're the one who did all of the things that we are blessed by. But God knows this, is that the one who says they shall be first at the end of the day will become last. And the one who is humbled and thinks of himself to be last shall be first in the kingdom. And so Gideon judges the people. And then Gideon, after his life, he dies and he leaves behind all of these sons by multiple wives and multiple concubines. These sons are going to be at war against one another. If you've ever had more than one child, you know sometimes the children can do what? They can fight for their parents' attention. Sometimes kids do that in doing something positive. And sometimes children will fight for our attention in doing something negative. You might be sitting here saying, I only have a one child. And they do that anyway, Pastor. They fight for my attention. But you know how it is when you've got multiple children. Sometimes they want to say, who is your favorite child? Here what we see in Judges chapter 9 is the story of one of Gideon's sons. It's a son uh, he named Amalek. Amalek's name in Hebrew means, My father is king. Now if you remember, Gideon was not king of Israel. Gideon was just a judge of Israel. Gideon was offered the kingship of Israel. He refused it, but he did not refuse the benefits of being king. And if you can find that in Judges chapter 8, if you want to look later on. So what we have is that Amalek, my father's king, is now going to do something that is so heinous that many of us would never probably study this or talk about it in Sunday school with our small kids. But today we're going to tackle even the tough scriptures and we're going to look at it today. So let's look at Judges chapter 9. Amalek, son of Jerubbabel. Now you might say, well, I thought you just said, Pastor, that he was the son of Gideon. He is, but Jerubbabel is also the name given for Gideon. It says that Amalek, son of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, went to his mother's brothers at Shechem, and he spoke to them and to all his maternal grandfather's clan. So what we have is that if you remember that Amalek is the son of Gideon, but he's also the son of a slave. He goes to Shechem because he's going to go to his own people who look like him, who have the same type of accent as he does, who dress like him, and he's going to say to them, right now Gideon has died, he's left all these kids in charge, wouldn't it be better instead of having all the sons of Gideon running the country to have just one ruler? Amalek is going to live up to his name. He is going to act like the son of a king. And here it says this, it says verse 2, Please speak in the presence of all the lords of Shechem. It is better for you, is it better for you to have 70 men, all the sons of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, rule over you, or one man rule over you? What is he wanting? He's not wanting what's best for the people. What he wants is what's best for him. And here we see is that he will convince his own people to do what? Join his allegiance and to go against his own brothers. And we're going to find out blood will be spilt. It says this, it says that, it continues. Remember that I am your own flesh and blood. Folks, it is dangerous. And if you're taking notes, here's one thing that might stand out to you. It is dangerous to take allegiance and join someone just because they have the same last name as you do or that they're in your family if they are wrong. You might say, well, Pastor, if my mama does this, regardless if she's right or wrong, or if my father does something, regardless if he's right or wrong, 
that, Pastor, that I should stand with them. Now, the Bible does say we should honor them. But we should not join the sins of our brothers and sisters. We should not join the sins of our cousins. We should not join the sins of our mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and forget that we have been grafted, we have been adopted into a whole other family. We do not abandon our family, but we do not put our family above God. And what this man, Amalek, is doing, he goes to his people and he says, I look like you, we have the same color skin, we bleed the same, we have the same grandpas and grandmas and all the other aunts and uncles, so isn't it better, instead of doing what God has called us to do right, isn't it better that we have allegiance to one another based on the way we look? I'll let you know today that still happens in America. It still happens today that you will have people say, when they're looking at someone, they say, well, that individual's white, so they've got to be a good person. Or that individual's black, they must be a bad person. I want to let you know that God said in the Old Testament when he was talking to David that God doesn't look at the outside of a man, God looks at the inside of a man. And so it does not matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white. The old song that we have sung as children, we are all precious in God's sight. Because as children of God, we have been grafted in to the family of God. I thank God that I have Hispanic brothers and sisters. I thank God I have black brothers and sisters. I thank God I even have a few white brothers and sisters. The point I'm getting at today is this. Is that when we take allegiance and we join a group just simply because that they came from the same town we came from, that they had the same color skin that we have, and we put that above God, something will go wrong. And what will go wrong? Pride. They will be prideful because of where they came from. You might have met someone that says, oh, I'm from Pender County, and they stick their chest out. Oh, I'm so proud of that. Maybe you haven't met anyone like that. The idea is this, is that here in Shechem, he goes to him and he says, isn't it better because I look like you and I come from the same family that you are from? Isn't it better for me to be king? And then in verse 3 it says, His mother's relatives spoke all these words about him in the presence of all the lords of Shechem. And they were favorable to Amalek. They enjoyed what they heard. He gets up and he gives this motivational speech. Join me because I'm one of you. And what happens? He speaks to their sin nature, and their sin nature will respond. Folks, today, if you want to know why the churches are not packed, I will tell you why, and it's no secret. It's because the church does not speak to the sin nature of an individual. The churches that often become packed and become mega churches are the churches that want to give you a feel-good philosophy and never tackle what sin is about. Here today we know that he speaks to their sin nature and they enjoy it. He tickles their ears and they giggle with pleasure. How do we know this? It's because of their actions. It says that while they're there, it says he speaks these words. They are pleased by this. And verse 4, So they gave him... 70 pieces of silver from the temple of Baal Baraf. Now what this is, these 70 pieces of silver, we're going to find out, comes from a pagan temple. They give him money to do something. They're not willing to go with him to kill his brothers because the only way that he could actually declare himself as the king is that there had to be no other brothers unless the brothers willingly gave their authority to him. Okay, so what happens is that they go and say, hey, we got some money over there in this pagan temple. Now, they don't call it a pagan temple, but there in Shechem, it's the temple of worshiping Baal. And it says that when they go there, they take out 70 pieces of silver. And in verse 8, Amalek hired worthless and reckless men with this money, and they followed him. You might say, well, that's no difference in today. Sometimes employers hire some Reckless people, worthless people with the money they have. But you have to understand and read the original Hebrew. What happens is that Amalek takes the 70 pieces of money and he goes and hires, the original text says, mercenaries. When it says reckless people, worthless men, 
meaning they would do anything for a dollar. Do you know anyone today, and do not testify, do not look at your neighbor, do not raise your hand, but do you know anyone today that would do anything for a dollar? You might say that maybe the modern day church will do a lot for a dollar. I have seen very good intentioned pastors change their style of preaching because they've seen the offerings lower and they say, well, I must do something and preach something to make the people feel so good that they're wanting to give more money. I will testify to you today this, is that for some reason if the finances of our church was to drop into a space of being afraid, we still will trust God, but we will not compromise the gospel, even if it means we come in here and preach with the lights turned out. I mean, we have proven that we can go outside and preach the gospel even when it gets so hot outside that I had to go home and I thought to myself, Lord, I'm about to have a heat stroke. But we still preach the gospel. The point I'm getting at is that there are churches just like individuals who will sell out their testimony for a dollar. You know, I was very weary and, and whenever the government said that churches could apply for certain loans and money that was available recently with the COVID-19 crisis, they were trying to bail out organizations. You've heard of that, haven't you? There are actually churches that took millions of dollars. Now, I knew in my spirit that if we as a church had applied for that money and were bailed out or given money by the federal government, I also know this. The one who gives you everything is also the one who can take everything away. And I knew that if we were to take bailouts from the government to pay a light bill, that I knew this, that our hope would be in what the government can do for us and not what God could do. I got past the idea of whatever we were meeting and I was wondering, well, Lord, what's going to happen? Is your people still going to be giving people? Is your people still going to be tithers? Are your people still going to make sure that the work of the gospel goes on? And after about a Sunday of thinking about that, I said, Lord, I'm not even going to worry about it. I put it in your hands and what a bill will be. But I will not apply for this money. Now, there were other Baptist churches, and I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying that I really think that it is kind of a tarnish on our testimony that actually applied and got that money. Well, my friends, I will let you know is that we must trust God other than our government. Here we see it says that they take this money, they hire mercenaries, killers, bloodthirsty men. In verse 5, they went to his father's house in Ortha, meeting Gideon. They go there and they kill, to kill his 70 brothers. This is important. The sons of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, on top of a large stone. Now stop there. How many of you know that there's no phrase, no word in the Bible by what? Accident. Okay? If it tells us they went to this certain area and that they went there to kill 70 of Amalek's brothers. Remember, what does he want? He just wants to be king. They went there and it says they killed them on a stone. I studied this and looked at it and have read commentaries and listened to other ministers' interpretation of it. And I come to agree with this. Where did the money come from to hire the mercenaries? It came from a pagan temple. Did you know in Old Testament times that pagans would actually have blood sacrifices on a large stone? Could it be that these men who come from a pagan background, who were paid by pagan money, go and sacrifice in a pagan ritual to a pagan god so that Amalek could become king? Everything starts to be like puzzle pieces coming together and you understand what happens. But how many of you also understand that when God's in control... That no matter if man comes against you that wants to take your life, if it's not time for you to go, my friends, you're not going to go. That's right. You might have been in a car wreck and say, I don't know why in the world I didn't get killed. Well, guess what? God wasn't ready for you to go home. 
You might say to yourself, I don't know why in the world I should have been dead 20 years ago. How many of you know there's been times in your life that you have looked back and thought to yourself, I shouldn't be sitting here today. Is there anyone else besides me that feels that way? I shouldn't be standing here today. But because that God wasn't done with me, I am here today. Amen? What we're going to discover is that these boys, these men, the sons of Gideon, are going to be slaughtered on this pagan area. But God's message wasn't done. So God's going to allow one of these men to escape. Let me prove it to you. It says, continuing in the text, it says that the 70 sons are going to kill on the large stone, but Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, survived because he hid himself. You see, when we hide ourselves, and it, you say, oh, well, he just hid behind the bushes. He hid in the mountains. But if you read the Psalms and the Proverbs, you understand there is a biblical principle. When we hide ourselves in God, He will protect us. He will deliver us. Amen? How many of you have ever held a newborn baby in your arms? You've done it? And that baby's so small and you seem to be so large and you hold that baby and you just you can just put them right there in your arms. I've seen babies so small and these big burly fathers holding them in their arms. And you don't even see the baby. It's almost as if they're hiding the child. If an enemy were to come in to, to attack the baby, they wouldn't have seen the baby. They'd only seen the father because the father was holding the baby in his arms in such a way you couldn't see it. Could it be, church, that God has been hiding us in His arms could it be that God has been blessing us and that God has been protecting us because God still has a message for us to give? I believe that. When you read the paper that I'm dead and gone, understand this. Understand that obviously God was done with the messages that I had to give. Because God doesn't make a mistake on the day and the hour that you die. And God didn't make a mistake on the day and the hour that you were born. Amen? I want to let you know there's no child in accident. And this son of Gideon by the name of Jotham is by no accident. It says he is the what? He is the youngest son. The youngest son is considered the least. What did I say earlier? The last can become first. And the first can become last. That's Bible Principles 101. So you have the youngest. You have a kid that he is able to hide and be protected. And it says, it continues with Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, survived because he hid himself in verse 6. Then all the lords of Shechem and Beth Melil gathered together and proceeded to make Amalek king at the oak of the pillar of Shechem. They thought their job was done. They had killed the brothers of Amalek. How I many of you know that God wasn't done with the lineage of Gideon? Verse 7. So now you're going to have, while they're going to do a coronation of Amalek, they're going to make him king. But then what you're going to have in Shechem, and the Hebrew word for Shechem means shoulder. And it's in a mountainous region that you've been able to stand on the mountain and you could speak. And how many of you know in those days it was like a natural amphitheater. They could speak and hundreds of people would have been able to hear it. Well, in verse 7, the young man who got away. That Jotham got away. Why? Because God wasn't done with him. Aren't you glad you've been able to get away from your enemies? Some of you are trying to get away from them right now when you just need to hide in the arms of Jesus. That'll preach. Verse 7. When they told Jotham, he climbed to the top of the mountain. And what does it say? He raised his what? His voice. Is there anyone here today who when you see injustice, when you see sin running a nation, 
when you see the problems that we are facing, is there anyone at all willing to stand up and be a voice for those who have none? Jotham was spared his life. Why? Because he was to be a voice, a mouthpiece for God. It says that when Jotham, he climbed to the top of this mountain, Gerizim, he raised his voice and he called to them and said, Listen to me, lords of Shechem, and may God listen to you. Now before we leave here, how many of you have ever heard of the word called a parable? Yeah. Jesus' most famous way of teaching was teaching by using what? Parables. Parables are short stories that have a biblical meaning, but on the surface they just seem to be an ordinary little story. You will be amazed, those are actually Old Testament parables. And here is one of the great Old Testament parables told by the escaped son Jotham, who God spared his life to preach this sermon. Here's the sermon. The trees sent out to anoint a king. Who are the trees? It's the people. Who is the king? We're going to find out. It says, to anoint a king over them, they said to us, to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I stop giving my oil that honors both God and man to rule over the trees? What does that mean? What it means is that the people wanted this ruler. It says the olive tree represents a ruler. If you remember, they wanted Gideon to be king. They wanted some man to be the ruler. But here it says that the tree, the olive tree says, No, it is better for me to serve God. And then verse 10. Then the tree said to the fig tree, so they couldn't get the first person to do it, to be their king, so they do what? It's kind of like a beauty contest. Number one's disqualified, so let's go with runner-up. It says, then they said to the fig tree, come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I stop giving my sweetness and my good fruits to rule over you? Meaning that God's made me to do one thing. Should I stop doing it to do something else? And then later the tree said to the grapevine, notice it continues to go down in the value. It says, come and reign over us. But the grapevine said to them, should I stop giving my wine that cheers both God and man and rule over the trees? Verse 14. Finally, all the trees said to the bramble. Now what is a bramble? A bramble is nothing more than these like, Weeds, uh, they don't produce anything. It is a vine. It's nothing more. It will take over a tree. It has no value. Most people would tear it down and burn it. So they say to these weeds, to the bramble, it says this. Come and reign over us. And look at verse 15, the response. Now the bramble here is an image of Amalek. He is not able to produce olives. He's not able to produce figs. He's not able to produce the grapes. He's not able to do nothing but do what? Destroy his own people. And then it says this. It says, finally, it said to the brambles, come and rule over us. The brambles said to the trees, if you really are anointing me, the king over you, come and find refuge in my shade. There was no shade in this. It's false political promises. Folks, be very careful to buy in to a politician. Because what is happening here is that Amalek is a skilled politician that says, Come and find refuge. Meaning, I will give you what you need, but you must surrender your rights. My friends, where have we gone wrong in our own nation that we're willing to surrender our rights to get what we need? We should never do that. And then it continues to say, come on and do this fine shade. Well, there was no shade. In verse 15, it continues, but if not, may fire come from the bramble and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Well, we must understand that fire would not naturally come from the bramble. And then we're going to finish up verse 16 through 21 and we'll be done. 
And now if you have acted faithfully and honestly in making Amalek king, now remember who's saying this? It's Amalek's brother, who's the youngest of Gideon's children, who had survived the massacre. It says this, If you've acted faithfully and done what is right and well to Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, and his family, and if you have rewarded him appropriately for what he did, for my father fought for you, he risked his life, he delivered you from the hands of the Medians. And now you have attacked my father's house today. You have killed his 70 sons on top of a large stone. And you have made Amalek, the son of a slave, king over you, the lords of Shechem, because he is your brother. Notice you made him king for the wrong reason. If then you have acted faithfully, and honestly with Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and his house this day. Then rejoice in Amalek. Oh, I love what he says. If you're not guilty, if you've not done nothing wrong, then jump up and shout about it. Right? If you're all big and bad and you didn't do anything crooked to get to where you are, then be proud of what you've done. But how many of you know that God is going to know the heart of Amalek and God knows why Amalek wanted power. And let's continue. Verse 20. Verse 20 is one of them things that he says that if you've not done nothing wrong, then don't sweat it. How many of you have ever, when your children, you know that they've done wrong and you say, look, if you didn't break the glass, don't worry about it. But if you did, Right? You've had mom and daddy tell you that before. If, if you've not done nothing wrong, then who cares? Right? And then it says this, verse 20. But if not, may fire come from Amalek and consume the lords of Shechem and Beth Milo. And may fire come from the lords of Shechem and Beth Milo and consume Amalek. Meaning that if you're guilty of doing what God said you should not do, may God... Have mercy on your soul, but may you also be punished. Notice it is not Jotham doing the punishing. It is Jotham turning over the people to God to do the punishing. Some folks say, well, I will get revenge. I will get vengeance. I will get justice. Well, my friends, when you're the one doing it, it will be sinful revenge, sinful justice. It will be sinfulness. Why? Because we will be doing that of our own action. How many of you know it's better for God to defend you and God to repay your enemies? The Bible says that whenever someone acts evilly to you, it says repay them with kindness and love. Why? Because the Bible says it's like pouring hot coals of fire on them. If we as a nation could learn to love one another instead of hate one another, if we as a nation can realize that regardless of where we come from and who our ancestors are, that we're all part of the same creed of being Americans, that maybe we would treat each other with respect and dignity. But until we turn to Jesus, all that we do in our own will still just be sin. It'll be sinners being nice to one another, but yet still be sin. It'll be sinners being polite, but yet still be sin. It is only when we turn to God that we realize that God is the one who can straighten a nation out, who can convict a heart. It is only God who can also punish a people when they're wrong. Here we continue. It says that he gives this speech. He says that if you've done wrong, may you be consumed by fire. May Amalek be destroyed by fire. Verse 21, and then we'll be finished. This is not the time of the sermon to say Amen. Then Jotham fled. Why? He's not stupid. He's standing there on top of the mountain. How many of you know that he strategically was in a good place? Because if you're talking to people down in the valley, he had a good little distance from him and to them that he could get away. Remember, he had already done what? He had already hid and survived the massacre. So he gives a sermon. And I love this. It's almost in this idea. He gives the sermon and then he dusts his shoes off. I've said what I've had to say. Now peace out. Goodbye. See you later. 
Because God's going to judge you and not me. I'm leaving this place. It is not the pastor's job to beat you down with the Bible. It's the pastor's job to present God's Word and let God do the work. I, I will tell you as we get ready to leave, it has been so many times I have preached God's Word on a Sunday morning, gave an invitation, encouraged the people, challenged the people, and wondered, did anything ever come about it? Because it seemed to be no results. And then a few weeks later, I'll have someone say to me, Oh, you remember that sermon you preached on so-and-so? I'm like, yeah. Well, oh man, I was driving in the car yesterday, and it was just like hot coals of fire. I realized I was the one guilty of that, and I'd had no clue of it. You see, whenever you just simply tell the truth, let the truth do its work. Sometimes right now, I will say this to you, we're trying to beat people over the head to get them to church. We need to invite them, we need to love them, but we need to let God do the work. Some of you have forced your kids to come to church. And yes, if they are in your house and eating under your dinner table, they should be going to church. I don't care how old they are. But you need to understand, it's only God that can convict them and save them. There's not but so much you can do. And what he does, Jotham, Jotham preaches and Jotham leaves. And let's finish up. It says this. The Jotham fled, escaping to Beer. And he lived there because of his brother Amalek. I close with this thought. Three years after Gideon died, everything fell apart. Think of that. It only took three years after the death of Gideon for everything that Gideon had done the 40-year reign, the judgments, the obedience, the faithfulness. Even when Gideon got it wrong, God still loved him. But for 40 years, now think of that. He reigned and ruled. Three years after he dies, his son, Amalek, who's what does his name mean? My father's king, slaughters all of those brothers on a pagan stone. Three years after he died, he does what? He has a youngest son stand up and preach a sermon and then get out of town. But my friends, understand this. If we put ourselves in the story, understand that what we are is that we are the bad guy of the story. We actually are. Because how many of us have been around goodness and godliness and we've been around perfection of the gospel, but it doesn't take too long to get away from it. Three years. Oh, I've seen, when I was at Campbell Divinity School, I've seen young men go to Campbell Divinity School, be on fire for God, graduate, and they didn't even know who God was. One of the saddest testimonies I had while sitting in chapel one day beside a young man who was about to graduate with his master's degree, he was going to be a minister of the gospel. He was going to preach the gospel. We sat side by side and they were talking in chapel about God and His goodness because believe it or not, preacher students had to go to chapel. Preachers being forced to go here preaching. Can you imagine that? He sat there beside of me and I remember this to this very day. He looks over to me and he and I are friends and he says to me this. He was more intelligent than I am. He could quote more scriptures than I could. He was someone that could become a PhD in any field he wanted to be. He was that kind of a person. He had more book sense than this old country boy has. But he looks over to me and he says this. He says, you know what, Ken? He says, all of what they're preaching about Jesus and God. He said, after our time here, he said, I've just come to realize I just don't believe it anymore. It didn't take but a little bit of time of being in a place for him to have all of that presented to him. And there's nothing wrong to have all of these things presented to you. It's good to know the different beliefs of the world. 
I've talked to Muslims. I've studied Judaism. I've been to Israel. I've talked to Hindus. I know what it's like to have these pagan conversations. I've talked to black and white witches, meaning I don't mean color of their skin. I mean, actually, they practice Wicca. And it's one thing to talk to them, but it's one thing to come and talk to them with such an open mind that your brain falls out. And we've got too many ministers of the gospel that has grown so close to the world that they've forgotten the God who's called them. Lord, I pray that never a day that we ever exchange the praises of man that we say we want the praises of man instead of the praise of God. The story of Amalek will not end today. If you come next Sunday, you'll find out Amalek will die a tragic death. You know why? Because what goes around... Y'all ever heard of that? What goes around does what? Y'all not asleep. It comes around. But you're going to find out it's God who gets justice. It is God who gets, does what's right. And what do we learn from this? We learn that we should be allegiance to God and we should put it in God's hands. We should hide in God's presence. And at the end of the day, God will deal fairly. Let's pray.